Right, thank you, members. Good evening. And good evening to members of the public. And before we commence the meeting, I'd like to draw your attention, please, to the fire regulations which are on the screen behind me. And also, please, can you ensure your mobile phones are switched to silent? Uh, Councillors, can you please speak directly into your microphones and make sure that your card is pushed firmly into the console? <coughs> Members of the public, I would like to say that uh, as a committee, we do understand that um, matters under consideration this evening could well be emotive for you. However, please be respectful of those around you and of this committee and uh, refrain from any form of disturbance. And so now we move uh, to the main items of business. So the minutes of the meeting which took place on the 13th of January 2016 have been laid on the table for the last 30 minutes. Are you content that I sign these as a correct record of that meeting? Thank you. Uh, have there been any apologies for absence, Gary? Uh, apologies received from Councillor Bob Upton, Chairman. Thank you. And have uh, members declared any interest before the meeting? Uh, none prior to the meeting, Chairman. Do members have any pecuniary or non-pecuniary or disclosable pecuniary, sorry, interest to declare? No. And have there been any questions received from members of the public, Gary? Uh, none received, Chairman. Uh, do we have any updates to government guidance or legislation that the committee should be made aware of, Elizabeth? Thank you, Chairman. There are none this evening, members. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, moving on to the quarterly planning enforcement report now, Victoria is going to take us through that. Thank you, Chairman. Um, members, may I? Um, there are no uh, verbal updates for the site specific for your um, areas this quarter. Um, just to draw your attention to page eight, the top of page eight, um, with regards to the cost cutter store. Um, it has now been retitled Premier Stores and will be known as that um, title from now on. Um, if I may draw your attention to the bottom of page 11, summary of caseload. For the last quarter, October to December, is a reduction to 184. And turning to page 12... The um, performance against local performance indicator, which is 70% of cases actually within 12 weeks, for the last quarter, October to December, we report 85%. Thank you, Chairman. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Councillor Wheatley. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Not a question, really. Um, congratulations, I think, are due for having uh, made a dent in all these. And can I also thank the team for their delicacy with the premier stores, particularly with the lady concerned? Because I know that this whole affair has greatly diminished the poor lady, and I, I really appreciate any help that can be given to her. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Victoria. And if there are no more questions, we now move on to the quarterly appeals report, and Catherine is going to take us through that. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Chairman. The first, there are two, two appeals for the, the last quarter. The first appeal is reported on pages 15 and 16 of the agenda. This was a committee overturn against the officer's recommendation to grant permission. This application concerned a residential extension to a property in Elstead, which was in the conservation area. The main issues for the appeal were whether the proposal preserved or enhanced the character of the conservation area and the effect of the development on the significant significance of the host building, which is a non-designated heritage asset. Um, in reaching their conclusion on this matter, the inspector considered that the proposal would result in substantial harm to the significance of the non-designated heritage asset and that it would also harm the visual character of the conservation area. On that basis, the appeal was dismissed. The second appeal for the quarter at the old post office in Godalming is reported on pages 16 to 17 of the agenda. There is also an associated costs decision um, which is appended to your appeals update sheet. 
The application was recommended by officers and subsequently refused by the committee. The proposal was for the change of use of the first and second floors of the existing offices at the building to residential. In considering the proposal, the inspector found that the property had been marketed for an appropriate time and was therefore satisfied there was no commercial demand for it to remain in office use. Further and importantly, the inspector noted that policy IC2, which seeks to protect employment land and sites, did not necessarily seek to protect single town centre sites such as this from alternative appropriate town centre uses. There was no evidence to suggest that the vitality and viability of the town centre would be harmed through the development, given that both offices and residential uses can be appropriate in this location. The inspector also took the view that in considering the lawful office use of the premises, this would have a higher shortfall in parking space provision than the shortfall proposed for the residential scheme. Given the sustainable location of the building, the inspector found that the proposal would be acceptable in terms of parking and allowed the appeal. As mentioned, the applicant did also make an application for an award of costs on this appeal. The inspector concluded that the council had acted unreasonably with regards to all four reasons for refusal. With regards to the first reason, which related to the loss of the office space, the inspector found the council had failed to produce any substantive evidence to support its view that the applicant had failed to market the, properly, the property for its lawful use. The inspector also found that the council had failed to acknowledge that in lying empty for 15 years, the building had not contributed in any way to the vitality and viability of the town centre for that time period and the council had also failed to take account of policy IC2 in its decision. Finally, the inspector concluded the council had failed to take into account the existing lawful use in relation to parking space provision, and that the council had failed to properly take into account a nearby similar development for mixed-use development, which had no parking provision. For that reason, a full award of costs was made to the appellant. That completes the quarterly appeals update, Chairman. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Councillor Wheatley. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Are we allowed to ask how much we're in for with the costs, please? Chairman, if I may, um, the, the award of costs goes to be independently assessed. We don't make that assessment, um, but the costs will be limited to those additional costs incurred by the applicant by going to appeal. So all the costs associated with representation, attendance, um, et cetera, preparation of documents um, could be costs that the council are liable for. I'll ha happily report back those costs as and when we're notified of them. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, in spite of all this, I am still disturbed by the inspector's contentment with um, the modest shortfall in parking space provision uh, when, you know, compared with the current parking guidelines. This is what we've all got to go on. And yet he seems to be, I think it was he in this case, seems to be quite content to sort of blur that particular point. And um, when he talks about the availability of nearby on-street parking, and given the highly congested area that we're in, it's, it's from, from my point of view, this is an un unacceptable and unreasonable conclusion that he's drawn. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. It is disappointing. I do agree. I don't know whether any officer wants to come back with any remarks on that question of parking. Chairman, if, if, if I can answer that one, I think the, the key point on this particular site, and it does arise from time to time, is that while we have the guidelines and we on your behalf apply them uh, consistently and rigorously and they are respected, where you have an existing lawful use of a building, the planning authority has to reasonably take into account what the extant demand of that use is and compare that against the proposed use. So what the message coming out of this is saying, it's not acceptable to start from scratch and say, notwithstanding what's in the building at the moment, you will provide a full complement of parking spaces because the argument comes back, well, we have an extant use, this is what we've got, and therefore you can't expect um, a full complement if we're under providing at the moment. So it's, it's a reasonable benchmark to apply. And in this instance, the, the, the inspector has drawn a, 
attention to that, that particular point. Um, but generally speaking, um, well, we don't have that check to make. As you'll be aware, the guidelines are being respected by inspectors, and we've been very successful with them. They demand a higher uh, a, a provision of car parking spaces because of our high car ownership, and we're managing to make that, that point quite forcefully in our negotiations with developers. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Elizabeth. Councillor Martin. Thank you. Uh, as I understand it, however, the, uh, the old post office is in fact being turned into something different with all the floors, uh, um, into office, into small office units, as I understand it. Uh, so if there's a change of use to, to, to residential, um, does that, would that mean he ha ought, the, the owner ought to come back and get it changed back again if, if all of the uh, units are to be in fact used for commercial purposes, or is, is that okay? It would depend whether they've implemented a, a different use. Um, obviously, the subdivision of offices and commercial space necessarily doesn't constitute a material change of use if they're all still offices. Um, however, if they've changed the use in the intervening period to residential, they may well have to come back in to change it back. So I guess it's the best of both worlds. He, he could change it to this for three years if he wanted to, but for the moment, he's, uh, or the owner has decided to make it into small business startup units, as I understand it. Um, so actually, my concern at the time was that the, there wasn't, um, that the marketing of the property wasn't that good in our view, and therefore we wanted to keep it for commercial and, and for jobs. So in the end, in fact, it looks as if he, the owner has actually done that. Thank you. So if there's no more observations or questions in relation to that, uh, we can move on. So in the event of site inspections being necessary, as a result of consideration of the applications at this meeting, these will be held on Monday, the 7th of March, at a time to be agreed. So moving on to the planning applications, and the first one is item A1, WA2015-2297. Thistle Ruff, High Button, Thursley, GU68NR. And Jennifer, would you like to um, introduce the application to the committee, please? Thank you, Chairman. The application is for the erection of a detached dwelling and detached carport and outbuilding, or outbuilding, following demolition of existing dwelling and outbuilding, as amplified by a plan and planning statement received on the 8th of February 2016. The application site, outlined in red here, is located to the south of Boundless Road and west of High Button. The site is surrounded by open fields with farm buildings and cottages located beyond to the southwest and southeast. The site comprises a detached dwelling and a detached outbuilding. The site is enclosed by timber post and rail fencing. These are the existing elevations of the dwelling. The dwelling includes a veranda that encircles the whole dwelling and has a height of 5.33 metres. These are the existing floor plans. This is the veranda that goes around the dwelling. Um, and in the roof space, this is the area here which is in the centre, which is over 1.5 metres in uh, head height, in height. These are photographs of the site. This is looking from approximately the access point towards the existing dwelling. And this is looking from within the site towards the dwelling. And this is the outbuilding proposed for demolition uh, within the scheme. I'm now going to quickly take you through the planning history on this site. Um, this is a, a permission that was given in 2013. The percentage increase in floor space of this dwelling over the existing dwelling would be 45%. The dwelling would be of a modern design and would have a height of approximately 4.6 metres with a ground floor level and then a subterranean floor level. This is a permission given in 2014 um, for a replacement dwelling and replacement garage. You can see here in the dotted line is the existing dwelling and this is the dwelling that was given permission. This is the existing outbuilding and then the uh, garage given permission <coughs> as well. Um, this is then the elevations of that permission. 
Um, it would have an increase in floor space over the existing dwelling of 49%. The design is more traditional than the 2013 permission in terms of style, materials and form. Also relevant to this application is a certificate of lawfulness which was given consent in 2013 for the erection of two outbuildings as shown on the plan here and here and this is the existing building and the access point comes up here. So this application seeks the permission for the erection of a replacement dwelling and a garage. Uh, the block plan shows the existing dwelling very faintly, is approximately here. And then it also shows the two garages that were given consent under a certificate of lawfulness there and there. The dwelling would be uh, partially located on the footprint of the existing dwelling. These are the proposed elevations of the dwelling, the proposed dwelling. Uh, the dwelling would be finished in clay roof tiles, timber boarding, a brick plinth, and would have a complicated roof form of gable ends, pitch roofs, and dormer windows. And these are the other two elevations. Um, it shows that there would be multiple ridge heights, as shown here and here, uh, with a maximum height of 6.76 metres. These are the proposed floor plans. The dwelling would have a width of 14.3 metres and a depth of 14 metres. These are the existing garage elevations, and these are the proposed garage elevations, which have two bays and a storage area to the side. The matters of principal and technical opinion for this application are the principle of development. The site is located within the green belt, outside any defined settlement area, where there is a general presumption against inappropriate development, which is, by definition, harmful and should not be approved except in very special circumstances. The planning history is a material consideration, a table which demonstrates the differences between the existing dwelling, the extant permissions, and the current application is set out on page 32 of the agenda. Uh, this demonstrates that the current proposal is significantly larger than those previously permitted. Other considerations of principle, or matters of principle and technical opinion are highways and parking provision and the impact on trees and ancient woodland. The matters of planning judgment which councillors are asked to consider this evening are greenbelt considerations. The MPPF states that certain types of development may be considered appropriate within the greenbelt. In this case, the MPPF does provide an exemption for replacement buildings that are in the same use and not materially larger than those it seeks to replace. Policy RD2A of the local plan states that a replacement building greater than 10% larger than the original building would be considered materially larger, subject to the assessment of the form, bulk and height of the proposal. As you're aware, we have applied this policy consistently and fairly across the borough. Members should be mindful of applying this policy consistently and to ensure that making any exception to this policy, the Council does not undermine its position in this regard. The proposed dwelling under this current application would be 153% larger than the original dwelling. Additionally, officers consider that the combined footprint, roof form, height, size and scale of the proposed dwelling would result in a dwelling that is significantly greater in bulk and mass than the original dwelling and would therefore be materially larger. Secondly, the assessment of very special circumstances. The very special circumstances that put forward by the applicant have been assessed as set out on pages 41 to 44 of the agenda and also on the update sheet. Officers consider that the fallback position set out by the applicant would not am amount to very special circumstances to uh, uh, outweigh the policies of restraint. The third uh, matter of judgment is the impact on visual amenity. The fourth is impact on Surrey Hills, AONB and AGLV. Officers consider that the overall bulk, mass, scale and form of the proposal would be intrusive within the landscape character of the area and as such would not conserve or enhance the AOMB or AGLV. And lastly, impact on residential amenity. Given the isolated location of the development and the separation between the site and neighbouring residential properties, officers consider there would be no harm to neighbouring residential amenities. As such, the recommendation is that permission is refused as set out on page 46 of the agenda and with an amended informative as shown on page 3 of the update sheet. Thank you, Chairman.
Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, this is a public speaking item. I believe the process has been explained. And so may I invite the supporters, Roger Turner and Fiona Secret, uh, who will be sharing the four minutes to speak. Good evening, Mr. Thank you. Turner. Thank you, Chairman. Secret. You, you have four minutes from when you begin to speak. Thank you. Um, good evening, members. Is uh, the microphone switched on? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, committee. Um, I'm Roger Turner. I'm the agent for this application. I was also the agent for the previous applications. Um, the committee report gives facts and figures comparing the proposal before you with the existing dwelling, which is the usual test. But I respectfully suggest that the special circumstances here require that the more appropriate test is comparing the proposed development with the available development of existing consents. If this application is refused, my class will be forced to fully implement the previously approved plans for a replacement dwelling with extension and ancillary garden buildings over several years. The, re the report before you contains very li little information on the extant consent and permitted development approvals which can already be built, and no plans of the extant consent for a replacement dwelling. Whilst this is not unreasonable, we felt it necessary to provide members with a planning statement and related plans and sections comparing the existing consents and the proposal before you. The comparative plans and sections clearly demonstrate that a new dwelling will not be proportionately the test in the MPPF, larger nor higher, deeper or wider than the buildings that can now be built as a fallback by my client. Indeed, they will be more large, what they will be larger and more spread out and therefore have a greater impact than the very clever design that you are judging tonight. The officer has issues with the design for having a complex roof form with multiple ridge heights and lines. But these features of a good design intended to avoid, are intended to avoid any suburban look by seeking to replicate the local vernacular of country properties that have been extended over the years. This is a very clever solution and, and a better one than building out the existing appro approvals and we trust that the new information provided this evening will allow a well-informed judgment to be made. We purchased this rough after falling in love with the site in September 2011. The derelict garden was a tangle of overgrown rhododendron, bramble, holly and bracken and the woodland and old conifer plantation. With our conservation background with the Wildfire and Wetlands Trust and my husband's large involvement in the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group, we could see the environment potential and in particular restoring the ancient woodland. To date, we have already adopted measures to encourage wildlife, and in the woodland, we have planted over 500 native trees to replace the conifers. After buying this property, we moved into the existing basic wooden house and started planning to build a new comfortable and sustainable home. With the property, um, we inherited an approved design for a futuristic building which was not to our taste and was out of keeping with the locality. We preferred a more traditional design and decided on a quality oak frame house as we feel it is more sympathetic to the surroundings and would blend into the rural nature of the area. Having gained consent for a placement building last year, we fully, fully intend to use our permitted development rights to build our approved garden buildings and an extension, which we would do as a stage project over several years. The application in front of you shows the whole project as one, a well-designed, efficient and cohesive build. There would be no objections to this application and 19 supporting letters, mostly commenting on the practical sense of a single phase build. Taking into account our environmental aims for the site and our intention to build a low impact dwelling using our permitted development rights, I ask the council members to consider the special circumstances that is ultimately the most sympathetic solution for our location, our neighbours and the environment. Thank you. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I have to stop you there. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Turner and Mrs. Secret. And um, 
we have no other speakers, so um, over to you, members. Councillor Holder. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. <coughs> Can I ask clarification on the uh, permission that was granted to the futuristic design uh, on page 27, 2014-1988? Was that the same size as the existing building, or is it the same size as the proposed building that Mr. Secret is proposing? Chairman, if I can clarify, the, I presume you're talking about the building which is on screen at the moment, Councillor Holder. Yes. Yep, I can confirm that building was larger than the building which is on site at present. It is partly subterranean, and therefore its impact above ground would be less. However, it is significantly smaller than what is now being proposed. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Martin. Could I just get clarification on um, what is and is not allowed with regards to permitted development? Um, we've heard that um, the... <coughs> current the, the extent permission, or so the, the current permission that that, that um, the applicant has um, could be done, um, uh, could be extended upon in, in the future with permitted development rights. I'm just interested um, for the committee to understand exactly how much further that property could be extended with those permitted development rights and what what they are. Thank you. Chairman, um, there would be some permitted development rights. Obviously, this site is within the AOMB, which puts an additional restriction. Therefore, there can only ever be single-storey um, developments restricted to four metres in depth under the general permitted development order at the rear of the property. So it would be constrained in that respect as to what they could carry out. Thank you, Chairman. If I could then just come back. So um, on that basis, that the, um, the, the current permission that we have is for an increase of about 45% on the current property. And if, let's say, there was a further single-storey extension of about four metres, is that likely to come anywhere close to 153% increase? And I mean, do do office, have officers got any indication of what sort of percentage that might get to um, if that were to be implemented. Because I think that that's very important for us to understand, to put, put that into context with um, the, uh, the, the current permission that's being sought. Chairman, could we come back to that question once we've uh, done some mathematics? Thank you. Yes, we can. Councillor Else. Thank you, Chairman. Perhaps while you're doing your maths, you could add in the um, outbuildings that have got certificates of lawfulness to see what sort of percentage that comes to as well. But as I understand this application or the history of this application, we have an extant planning permission for a dwelling. We have a certificate of lawfulness for two outbuildings. And once the approved dwelling is built, we can use, per or, sorry, not we, the applicant can use permitted development for another four metres, which I think is would be four metres by 11 metres, so it's about 44 square metres. Um, that, th that permitted development on the dwelling would bring that up to 178 square metres and the outbuildings are 49. So we have a total of 207 square metres spread over the site in two or three different buildings. Um, I, I just, I'm, I'm inclined to think that it would be nicer to have one building of, of a slightly smaller area, and um, that would seem to me to better fit our relationship and our aims of our green belt and rural settlement policies, which try to um, restrict the number of buildings in the green belt. If we could have one building that added up to slightly less than all the other buildings scattered around, uh, that would seem to make sense to me. And we do have a policy, RD3, that requires that outbuildings should not appear intrusive. Well, if those outbuildings could be removed and incorporated in the dwelling, 
um, that would seem to me to preserve the openness of, of the green belt a lot better than having the one dwelling that's been approved and the outbuildings that have been approved, plus the permitted development extension. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. Um, well, Councillor Els, male, Councillor Els, has made my point uh, very well. I, I do agree with him, and I'd like to really, I suppose, ask the officers on page four of the update sheet whether they agree with those figures that have been provided, which does seem to indicate that the existing permitted development equates to perhaps something close to 250 square metres, whereas the proposed development would only be 205 square metres. In any case, I'd like to know whether it, the proposed development would be lower or less than the existing permitted development, and I do agree with Councillor Rouse that uh, I would much rather see one building which looks attractive than a hodgepodge of three different buildings which could all be built, because um, I think that would be much more intrusive into the countryside. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor James. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm referring to that on page four of our update bit. Um, whilst it's very a thank you to the applicant for, for, for providing and filling in the pink bits, um, I noticed that actually you didn't fill in the blue proposed garage. And actually, if you added that, blocked that to the side of the blue side bit, actually, it actually brings it out much, much wider than the pink one. Um, but also, I presume, I don't know whether the outbuildings that had consent were resi had residential occupancy, because that makes a lot of difference. If the two outbuildings hadn't got residential occupancy, then if they're incorporated, as they're trying to say now, into the main building, that alters them completely. Um, and then you no doubt in some distant future they'll require outbuildings, because the garage that they propose is also an outbuilding. Um, so could you tell me whether the two outbuildings that have permission had residential occupancy? Thank you. Perhaps I can just mop up some of those queries that have been raised there. Um, with regards to the first query raised regarding the increase in habitable floor space with regards to permitted development and what could likely be carried out, it's likely with a rear extension they could extend the property um, by 100%, so they could double the size of the property. Um, I think it's important, however, to draw the distinction between an outbuilding and habitable accommodation. The two are separate. Um, those outbuildings could or would need to be built as incidental buildings, i.e. not replicating primary habitable accommodation in order for them to be permitted development under the terms of the general permitted development order. There is a distinction. Policy RD2, and in fact Greenbelt policy in the MPPF, allows a proportionate extension providing it's to a building um, and is proportionate in all other respects. But we need to draw the distinction here, as you've quite rightly pointed out, between habitable and non-habitable accommodation and the pressure that that may create in the future. With regards to policy RD3, policy RD3 in Greenbelt terms refers you back to the National Planning Policy Framework and policy C1, where the erection of new buildings is inappropriate development and there therefore must be very special circumstances to justify those developments. So the tests, the further tests of policy RD3 are not applicable necessarily in the green belt because you are restricted in terms of building new buildings per se. I hope that clarifies some of the questions, but I'm happy to answer any further ones that I may have missed. Thank you. Um, it now, Councillor Martin is next, but um, is it in relation to what we've just heard from Catherine, Councillor Martin, directly? Because I think... There's another query on that. We must yes, Councillor Else. Thank you, Chairman. My point with the outbuildings and, and policy RD3 was that w we look to not have outbuildings it being intrusive and so if my point was if they're incorporated within if that area is incorporated within the dwelling it's less intrusive so that's more in tune with the green belt policy than having odd buildings no matter what they use for i think the the certif certificate of lawfulness application showed them as a uh, workshop and a gym or a games room or something which are well residential to all, but all intent and purposes thank you all right, thank you. And Councillor Martin. Um, thank you. Yes, I've been doing my arithmetic here as well, and I'm a bit confused. Um, the uh, table on page 32, or um, there are various tables elsewhere, talks about 
of the proposed dwelling under this application with habitable floor space of 221.53 uh, square metres. <clears throat> On the uh, page four of the update sheet that we have before us, uh, it talks about the total area of proposed development of 205 um, square metres. I just wonder whether you could um, sort of uh, do a bridge uh, between those for me. Um, two, I, I guess uh, I have to say I'm very sympathetic with the views of Councillor Els and, um, and Councillor Reynolds. Um, I have to say I quite like this, um, this uh, the, the building, it, and it, it's in a... Um, it, it's not as if we're, we're considering an application with many buildings or, uh, and changes. This is a single building in a remote spot, uh, and I'm not sure. I, I mean, I understand the rules, but I have to say, I, I, I feel I feel that we ought to try and look for an exception. Um, uh, and uh, I, I'm quite persuaded by the idea that we could uh, have this uh, single building rather than a, a spread of <coughs> hodgepodge um, buildings around the place. The only other question that I have is <coughs> whether we could approve this but not allow any further permitted development. Would that be a reasonable condition um, to add if we were minded to uh, approve? Chairman, if I may, that certainly would be a recommendation of officers that you restrict any further extensions and indeed any outbuildings if you are looking to find very special circumstances for them to incorporate those two different buildings into one singular building. Um, if members are minded to obviously go against the officer's recommendation, you will need to articulate what are the very special circumstances in this case of allowing this development as your reason for granting permission. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chairman. Um, when I first sort of opened up these pages and uh, saw that the recommendation to refuse was there, and then as I was working through the sort of initial pages, I thought, this can't be true. And yet, as the pages went on, the um, arguments were very cogently and powerfully presented within the rules that, you know, planning has to abide by. And I also appreciate um, Jennifer's point about consistency of application, uh, the importance of consistency of application, um, you know, throughout all our uh, planning applications that we deal with. For, for me, it seemed that the important areas were aspect of green belt not being harmful. Um, the AONB conserving and enhancing, and the AGLV conserving or enhancing. And I feel, and this is my judgment, that um, it's, it's, not been, it's not a proposal that is harmful, and I feel the other conservation aspects are in there. And I feel this is a special case in the sense that the size of this building, the foot... Uh, footprint of this building is 0.2 hectares within the 0.38 and that represents a 6% um, you know do you understand what I'm saying Percentage there's so much confusion sorry within Percentage. the site yes so that is very very small and I'm sure that our particular um, rules and things are trying to cover all particular sites but you can't cover every possible uh, situation with, um, with the rules that we might write, um, write down. And the other aspect is that there has been no objections to this proposal at all and from a significant number of people. And they're the people who are in the area. And I think that a planning committee should be giving some consideration to what the local people feel. So I and beginning to sort of feel that um, as a committee we should recommend, but obviously we shall see what happens. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. Um, well, you asked for special circumstances and why we should allow this, and I think they are, that I would much rather see two rather sympathetically designed buildings on this site than four hodgepodge things, which are probably going to be a very different design potentially. Um, they may not marry up together. Um, I think, you know, I do a lot of walking, I love the countryside, I would be the first to, to try and protect a ONB and Green Belt, but there are exceptions to be made, and I think 
the proposal is going to be an improvement on what could happen. And I know there's a what could happen, but we've got to think about what could happen. And uh, I think if we can be also spared that rather ghastly 2013 permission, then I think we'll all be very grateful. And thank you. And um, Elizabeth, I believe you wanted to say something. Thank you, Chairman. Just to come back on Councillor Lee's point, um, I just wanted to remind members, notwithstanding the point you made, Councillor Lee, that a very important um, point behind policies RD2 and RD2A um, are that they don't distinguish between dwellings in different size plots, specifically says this in the text, to permit a significant increase in the size of dwellings merely because they are sited on large plots would undermine the objectives of safeguarding the openness of the Greenbelt and the character of the countryside. So I would guard against um, making that judgment as a, as a material consideration for this application because what it's suggesting that the, the bigger the plot, the more discreet the plot is, the more latitude should be given to the, the size of extension. So the, the, the policy just really requires you to make a visual judgment in relation to the impact of the new size of dwelling in comparison to what's existing, but also take into account the fallback which has been articulated in terms of what else could, could, could be um, carried out. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, uh, Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you. Um, I have to say I'm still minded to approve and, um, but I'm, I wouldn't support an approval if this placed our planners in a very difficult position for future applications. In other words, if we were establishing a precedent here, which would be um, difficult <clears throat> in, in the future, because we, I mean, it's, we, we, it, we can have an exception, but is it truly exceptional, or could it be used as, as a means of a precedent for the future? And I'm, I, so I would be, I have to say, um, I, I think the argument about not having the, 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 the visual effect of this proposal, it seems to me, is quite good. And I think the visual impact of several buildings or, or what could, could happen to this um, development is not so good. And, and I just wonder whether we could look at the update page four. And if the, it, can we use the argument here that the total area of existing permitted development would, would in fact uh, um, go up to 258 metres and what we're looking at is only 221 metres and if we were to uh, take away permitted development rights would that then be a reasonable decision which wouldn't give us a difficulty in the future and the justification as far as I'm concerned is that the impact visually is, 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 is beneficial uh, we have fewer buildings uh, rather than many buildings uh, and you know I, that, I, it, it's, that's, that's, I don't know whether that's powerful enough uh, but that's what I would like to do but I wouldn't want to place us in a very difficult position vis-a-vis -vis further applications in the future Thank you, Councillor James. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Whilst um, I understand um, Councillor Else with a, a, the sort of hodgepodge of outbuildings and it would be nicer to put it all into one place, that really worries me. We have l hundreds of houses, developments in the Green Belt, in OANBs, in national parks that all have little outbuildings. That's what goes with houses in the countryside, little cottages. If we decided that actually it would be nicer to knock down all those outbuildings and, and put one smart house, that, that just goes roughshod through all the policies that everybody can start knocking down outbuildings, incorporating them to one larger house. The whole idea of country houses and cottages is you have little sheds outside, loos, old-fashioned little sheds and stuff. I, I find that very, very worrying if we were going to go down that on this application and then we, other people would be using it in the same one. It, that really, really worries me. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Are there any more comments, observations or questions from members? So, the recommendation is, Sorry, Ma 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 yes, Councillor Martin. I, I wonder if we could have further comments from our officers before we try and get to a decision here. I, 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 mean, I, I, I really do buy what, what Anna has just said. I think that's a very powerful argument. Um, and I'm worried about setting precedents, which would be difficult for the future, and I wouldn't want to do that. However, I have to say, I, I rather like the, the proposal that we're looking at, uh, and I find it better than the one that's there before. And, and the only reason that I can come upon is this business of consolidation. 
all, all but still taking account of Anna's uh, comments, and I, I'm, I'm really on a very difficult position here. I want to say yes, but I fear that, um, that I should not, because I think that's going to put the planning department in a very difficult position. I would just appreciate some comments from the officers on that. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think that I have to say um, that if you do approve this application on this basis, it will um, send a message to anyone that's listening or aware of it that this is an approach that can be acceptable to the council. Now, having said, said, said that, you are making a judgment of this individual case on its merits and taking a view that you like what they are proposing and its individual characteristics. Maybe that is enough for you to come to the conclusion it is very special. But um, I have to say, I don't think it is very special. Having worked with this policy for over 20 years, it's certainly not the first time that we've had this type of approach put to us, and it won't be the last. And um, many, many landowners in the Greenbelt, as, as Councillor James um, ex expressed, um, have a similar setup to this. They have a dwelling, they have a number of outbuildings, and they find it desirable to consolidate their accommodation in one building. Um, perhaps to, to improve the design, perhaps to improve the energy efficiency, but then there's always a demand for other outbuildings over and above that because a development, a, a, a residential curtilage normally has a building to live in and buildings to serve it in the curtilage. Um, so in that sense, the motive behind the application is not very different to a lot that we see and it's certainly not very special in its case. So I think, in summary, Chairman, the committee need to decide that the, whether, whether they feel the approach is very special, and I have to say I don't think it is, or whether you think the overall eventual outcome that the applicants are seeking to achieve is so very special in its intrinsic qualities and what it will do to improve the landscape quality and the appearance of the Greenbelt is sufficient to warrant an approval on the basis of it being very special. I hope that helps, Jim. Thank you very much. Councillor Martin, I think... If we could Thank you. This, can, I, can I just say, that was exactly what I was looking for, and, and I will therefore, um, although I think it's a head and heart thing, my, my, my heart wants to go with the application, but my head is swayed by uh, the, the, the comments uh, from Elizabeth, and, and, and I feel it would be a precedent which would perhaps be, be wrong, and therefore I will be voting with the officers on this. Now, is that the end of the debate? So we now move on to the recommendation. And the recommendation is that permission be refused for reasons one to three and informative two as set out in the report, plus amended informative one as set out in the update sheet. So may I have those in favour of the recommendation to refuse, please? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And those against refusal. One, two, three, four, five, six. Any abstentions? So thank you, members. The recommendation to refuse is agreed. And now we move on to item B1, WA 2015-2037, Rendlesham, Manorley Road, Milford, GU85EF. Tim, would you like to introduce the application to the committee, please, when you're ready? Thank you, Chairman. Members, starting off with the site location, the site's located on the western side of the Godalming Guildford bypass, um, as you can see outlined here in, in black. Um, the site currently forms part of the um, 
parking area and rear garden serving that serves Rendlesham, property known as Rendlesham here, which fronts Manley Road. The site surroundings consist of residential properties here and on the opposite side of the Goldwyn Gilbert Bypass Road and the petrol station uh, just to the south. The proposal is for the erection of a pair of um, semi-detached two-storey dwellings. Um, each dwelling would be three bedroom and um, you can see outline here on, on the proposed block plan, the outline of the proposed dwellings. Um, the properties would be served by um, eight metre rear gardens um, and where the, the site would split and then the remainder garden would serve Rendlesham. The properties would be served by um, parking spaces at the front, which would be a shared, um, shared parking areas. Um, the proposal um, also includes the widening of the existing access, vehicle access into the site. Uh, the vehicle access is lawful um, and it does provide, at the moment, um, secondary access to the rear of uh, Rendlesham. Turning to the proposed dwellings themselves, um, here is the proposed design and scale. Um, proposed design, uh, more sort of traditional um, looking properties um, with um, uh, wooden framing, uh, exposed brick and clay tile roof. Here is the proposed rear elevation and the proposed side elevations. This is the proposed ground floor plan for both properties. Um, they would largely mirror each other in their layout. Um, lounge and kitchen diner entrance at the front. This is the proposed first floor plan. Um, three bedrooms for each and um, bathroom. And here's the proposed roof plan. Um, <coughs> members will note in the committee report that there is an extant planning permission on the neighbouring site to the north um, for a detached property. Uh, this proposed street scene drawing um, shows here on the right hand side an outline of this uh, front elevation of this extant permission. Um, so that helps put in a little bit of context. Turn to some site photographs. This is a view um, from within the site looking, looking northwest uh, toward the rear of the property known as Rendlesham. This is a view looking east um, showing the existing, existing access currently here. Uh, the side elevation of the petrol station kiosk is here. This is a view from the rear garden of Rendlesham. Um, so the properties would be positioned behind here um, with their rear elevations here. And this is the existing access drive um, on the Golden Guildford Bypass Road. Um, as outlined earlier, the access would be widened here to allow for easier movement into the site. Um, members will note in the agenda that we have put in the detailed response from the County Highway Authority on the access um, as a, in terms of their assessment. Um, members will note that they, they don't raise objection to, to the access um, in that access could be, um, access to the site via vehicles could be done safely and cars could enter and, turn and come out in a forward gear. Further, there would be space for cars to pass um, the refuse and recycling lorries which would serve the properties from this road. <coughs> in terms of determining issues with this application, um, members of the matters of judgment for you this evening um, are the, the impact on the green belt and compliance of policy RD1. Uh, you'll note in the officer report the, um, the slight conflict with policy RD1 in green belt. Um, uh, however, um, you'll note the officer's um, considerations in that site could be suitable for residential development. Visual amenity and landscape considerations, always a judgment. Um, we have considered the proposal on its own merits 
um, but also with acknowledgement of the extant permission next door, um, and should they both, should that be implemented as well? And the impact on residential community, um, also acknowledged that the proposals would be visible from neighbouring properties. However, we're satisfied that the distance is such that it would not be harmful. Officers therefore recommend permission be granted. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, um, Tim. And um, so now, Councillor Martin. Um, well, here we are. Um, the, the, the wedge opens. Um, I, I have to say I, I'm appalled that this application is before us. Um, and um, I would love to, th to come up with a reason and a justification for turning it down. But we have the extant permission next door, um, which went through two committee meetings, site visits. I mean, we, we dealt with that to death. We had highways here. Um, and I think the only justification that we would probably have for this is highways. Um, and I don't see any reason why we should revisit the highways issue, which was um, discussed and debated to death on the extent permission. Um, and uh, therefore, with significant regret, um, I will have to vote in favour of this application because I simply don't see a justification for turning it down, much that that um, causes me significant distress. Councillor Thornton. Thank you, Chairman. And obviously, just to remind Councillor Martin what he said, it will set a precedent of the whole road. And we see, we see this one, and we'll see the next one, and then the next one. So there's no point in going over old ground, like Councillor Martin said about the uh, highways issue. It is what it is, so... Thank you. And um, Councillor Reynolds, did you indicate you wanted to speak? No. Um, so, Councillor Marshall. Uh, thank you. I think the County Highways are wholly wrong in this. Um, I disagree strongly with what they uh, recommended uh, last time. I continue to disagree with them, uh, but we haven't got a leg to stand on, uh, and I will have to vote in favour of this, even though I'm wholly against it. Thank you. And Councillor Holder. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I tend to agree with Councillor Martin Jr. and with Councillor Thornton that, unfortunately, I think as we give them permission for the extent of this property next door, we have no grounds for refusing this application. However, it does worry me that every single house in Manorley Road is also going to do this all the way through to the roundabout, mm -hmm. and it's going to cr create chaos. But So very reluctantly, I'm going to have to agree with them. Thank you. I think we have uh, highways uh, to be grateful to in some small way. Um, Councillor Elf. I usually speak loud enough that everybody can hear me anyway. Just to reiterate what everybody else has said, really, I mean, it, it, I find it rather irritating. When we had a site visit out there, we were fed this story that that nice new tarmac entrance was only there so the gentleman in the house could get his manure in for his vegetables. Um, and lo and behold, here we are with a pair of houses. I, I just wonder, I mean, again, are we being taken for idiots when they show dormers on the back and it says loft space ready for possible future conversion? Can't we, can't we have two-storey houses along there? I don't remember the extant um, permission having roof lights before, and now suddenly on these drawings, that, or the drawings we were shown on the screen, we, we, we've got roof lights, and so that looks like it's ready to be three-storey. And they're all backing on to other houses. It just seems to me that it, it would be nice if we could say to them, well, yes, this house, okay, we're going to recommend it for approval, but only if you make it two-storey. I don't see why every new house in the Waverley area these days seems to be three-storey. And it's just developers squeezing that extra little few pounds out of each plot. Thank you. Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chairman. Um, these particular um, houses um, I quite like the look of, but I would temper that by saying on any other site but this, a site that uh, gives much more space. Now, um, I find it very, and they're clearly family-oriented. 
So they're not going to be offered at affordable rents or for single people, they are family oriented. And bearing in mind, as Councillor Els has said, uh, he's picked up on this aspect of the roof space uh, for further modification. It seems to me that it would only be sort of internal fit out. So then we move from three bedrooms to a possible four bedrooms. Yet another person, perhaps via Airbnb. I think we've got to think about the MPPF's emphasis on sustainable development. So that's for the here and now, as well as for the future. And I'm not seeing that this particular um, application um, is good for the future or can guarantee harmonious living. And let me also say that um, highways are quite happy for Veolia to sort of park on the highway and uh, then pick up the bins. Um, interestingly, the dr driver would not be getting out onto the highway and the people who load the bins um, get out on the uh, curbside. Um, so that um, satisfies, if you will, the emphasis that they placed on safety last time around. But what about these delivery vehicles like the UPDs, you, um, sorry, see, um, sorry, HGVs. well, HGVs, yes, but I'm also thinking about the large delivery vehicles for Amazon and, and the like. I don't see them, in reality, going down into this 3.8 metre wide drive into this parking area. So therefore, the driver has to get out onto the road. Now that's a safety thing. And interestingly this time, in the voluminous report by um, highways, for the first time I think they've started to talk about um, not causing a disruption to the movement of vehicles. We get um, three, three, um, three um, phrases like that on page 56. And then we can come across, can we say, we've talked about, or I've talked about it being a family accommodation. So we've got children involved, more than likely, even if not in the beginning, uh, towards the end. It's funny that these people, uh, children are going to be so disadvantaged by compared to the Rendlesham property in the amount of space there is. And what about when they sort of run out of um, being able to entertain in that rear space? They've then got to come out onto the front. And there is the Amberley play area um, out in the sort of Amberley area. So they will be coming out. There's no footpath to help them. They're, and so how does a, a mum, a young mum, for example, a young father, pushing a pushchair, how do they then mount this banking, which there is a banking by the side of this drive, to get in front of the service station? It, it, it's... And isn't it interesting, they show, was it on that one, wheelchair-bound people. There's absolutely no way wheelchair-bound people can get out of that particular area. And sort of finally, I come back to you know, my gripe about enough parking space and indeed the ability to manoeuvre around. I personally don't believe there is a sufficiency there because we've got this contrived area coming down a very narrow approach and so on. It does not give rise to harmonious living here. There's going to be some very special relationships between one neighbour and the next. And you know there's a shared uh, parking space there, so when family in block A have a visitor, then family in block B can't have a visitor on the same day, sort of thing. I just, it's terrible. <laughs> so you will understand that with this being in my ward, there is no way, because I'm supposed to be standing up for my ward and the people who live there and have to put up with living conditions there is no way can I support this in spite of you know the well presented um, you know facts that Tim has produced okay, sorry thank, about that thank you councillor Lee uh, councillor Reynolds please well, this is really a question as to why they are putting a dormer and um, roof lights in the roof space but not providing any stairs up to it and it does say on the plans proposed or potential accommodation I mean why don't they just do it in the first place uh, uh, and or, or are they going to come up you know once we give permission if we give permission with an amendment and put another two bedrooms up there I, I don't really understand it and 
if we're not happy about it, perhaps can we say that there should be no habitable accommodation in the roof because that will undoubtedly only make the houses bigger with more people and uh, exacerbate the problems that Surrey Highways are undoubtedly going to uh, let happen. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. Uh, Councillor Lee, if you, could be, if you could be brief. Did I overstay my welcome last time? Um, yes, can I just say that if the committee does decide it ought to be uh, approved, then can I draw attention to the uh, height to the windowsill of the dormer window? So that's the windowsill. It's six and a half metres from ground level. Now that puts it quite high and is looking down over onto the um, rear people in Curlews, for example, um, as well as obviously Rendlesham itself. So therefore I would want a condition in there to say something, or I hope there could be a condition put in to say something about the glazing. Officers, do uh, we've had two suggestions actually, one about putting in a condition about the third story and now about the glazing. I wonder if we could have your advice on that, please. So, Chairman, on the um, overlooking issue at the back, um, in the assessment, we've taken into account the, the dormer windows. Um, and under the, the residential amenities section of the report, we've looked at the, the distances between um, not only the existing property, Rendlesham, um, but also the neighbouring one known as Curlews, um, which their nearest, um, their nearest amenity space is their rear conservatory. Um, and that distance um, measured on plan is 30 metres um, and Rendlesham would be further than that. Um, so that's compliant with our guidelines. Um, so overall, we're happy that there can be clear glazing um, should it come forward for, for conversion. Thank you. And there was just one other question about the third uh, story, the, the, whether we could um, not allow that. Well, your, the benefit of your advice on that sort of suggestion, please, yes or no, or? Um, Chairman, if I could answer that. The fact is that the, the judgment you're making is whether you think it's too high as designed. Um, whether they occupy it or not doesn't make it any higher um, because all they're doing is occupying a roof form that you would have approved. So in deciding whether or not you think this particular form is acceptable, you are taking into account the fact that it's, it's not three storeys, it's, it's a two-storey dwelling with rooms in the roof. Um, bearing in mind what's been approved next to it, um, it, it seems to the officers that it's not of an inappropriate height. If the concern, however, is that the roof void would be used in the future for habitable purposes, um, then we would um, guide you to um, identify what harm that would generate. I think Tim has already hopefully satisfied you it wouldn't cause any material overlooking issues, and we've taken that um, aspect into account in the report. So um, it does beg the question, if they did use the roof void for habitable purposes, what the planning harm would be? Um, and before you um, applied a condition to say thou shalt not use the roof without consent, you would need to identify why you are controlling it in that way. Um, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Elizabeth. And um, Councillor Wheatley. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, a point of clarification, actually, please. On our page 64 showing those sketches, the buildings look very much squatter. They look taller and narrower in that s screen. Do we know which proportion is most likely to be the mirror accurate? Yes, I'm advised that possibly the project, projector screen, but um, Tim's... Members, for, for clarity, we're just going to pass round to the members the actual submitted plan so we can say for certain we have shown you the definitive version. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you.
I think we, we need to, to move on. If we could look at that and digest it inwardly. And Councillor James, you are on my list next. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It was just, I, I still go back to the Solars House. I cannot remember Solars being a three-floored building, a two and a half story. It was a two story building. Can we guarantee as this is these plans have been submitted by the applicant, all I would say is that this house can be no higher than that which was granted at Solars. Because I think this is their mock up of, of the house and solars because it didn't have roof lights. And that as we haven't got the plans for the solars one, perhaps we could say it cannot be any taller than because it wasn't a three-floored building. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can we say that, officers? Um, just confirm, Chairman. Yes, the, um, I looked at the permission of an assessment of, the, of this one next door, and it did have um, a room in the roof, um, although it did not have dormers on the back, just roof lights and roof lights on the front. Thank you. Okay, are there any, any last questions or observations? Councillor Holder. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I have to say I'm slightly confused about these bedrooms because on page 48 it says each dwelling shall have three bedrooms at first floor level. And if, if you look at the drawing on the west elevation on page 50, there are two enormous dormers there. It obviously, it's been designed to have two extra bedrooms in the roof. So, uh, no, so it's no, a lot of space which is ready for habitable apartment. Can you look at those? No, no, but, it, it, yeah. but it says it's ready for habitable apartment. Okay. I'm just slightly confused, that's all. Okay. Um, so, are we ready now to move on to the recommendation? Yeah. So, um, we are going to move on now to the recommendation, but I do have to inform you, Councillor Thornton, you are not able to vote on this uh, application as you left the room during the debate. And so we go on now. Uh, the recommendation is that permission be refused for the reasons one, wrong one, sorry. The recommendation is that to, um, no, that's the wrong one as well. I'm out of order here. That's the one. I've got it, sorry. Um, the recommendation is that subject to conditions one to 17, you with me? Am I all right, right this time? And informatives 1 to 13, as set out on pages 71 to 80 of the report, permission be granted. May I have those in favour, please? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And those against? One, two. End abstentions. So, uh, thank, thank you, members. The recommendation to grant is agreed. Okay. We're moving on to item B3, WA 20151659. B2, 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 sorry. B2, oh, I oh, is it wrong? Mm. No. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Item B2, WA 20152051, Museum Block, Charterhouse School, Hurtmore Road, Godalming, GU7 2DX. Tim, would you like to introduce the application, please? Thank you, Chairman. Members, site location. Um, site located, is located within the Charter House School grounds, uh, which is on the south side of Hurtmore Road here. Um, the school comprises various buildings and grounds, uh, many of which are listed. Um, the buildings... Sorry, my mouse. Um, the buildings within the school site, um, actually outlined in blue, is the ownership of the school grounds. Um, but the actual applications relates to development going on here and here within the school. Members, the proposed site plan here, um, the proposal is for extensions to the existing building on site known as the museum building, which is here. 
Uh, the proposal also includes demolition of some existing buildings, uh, notably here, here and here. Um, the proposal also includes erection of a new toilet building and also several temporary porter cabins um, for, for um, the construction whilst the construction goes on. Um, the porter cabin buildings themselves um, would house um, some facilities which are currently in the existing museum building, um, which would be IT and finance over here. Um, over here would be school, the temporary school shop. Um, in pink over here is the temporary port cabin for the sports break area. And the green building here is the permanent toilet building proposed. The pr proposal itself, um, this is the proposed extension to the museum building. Um, this is the proposed north elevation, which would face north towards Hurtmore Road. Um, it is of a contemporary design with a mix of uh, materials. Uh, extension includes three feature chimneys, as you can see here. Um, these provide added vi visual interest to the building, but also serve as a function for natural ventilation for fume extraction to serve the new proposed chemistry laboratories. In terms of materials, uh, the the main bulk of the extension would be in uh, exposed facing brick. Um, Precast stone would be used here in the white bits, top of the chimneys, and also at the bottom. Aluminium frame windows are proposed. Uh, bronze metal seamed roof is proposed. And metal screen cladding uh, in to, to provide a break between the first and second floor. Uh, first and ground floor windows, here and here. And metal louves are proposed to the very tops of the chimney features. The south elevation, um, so this would be facing within to the school, um, which is proposed here. You can see there in the distance the chimneys um, handed obviously the other way. Um, the south elevation um, again, would be in a um, mixture of brick and precast stone. Um, it also would have some timber loofs, um, which would provide natural um, cladding features to the uh, first floor balconies. This is the proposed east elevation. Again, in this elevation, mainly facing brick, um, with metal cladding in between the windows. And the, and the bronze roof. And again, the western elevation. Um, you can see here the sides of the chimneys uh, and the roof coming down. Uh, again, exposed brick. And here is the um, timber loose I outlined earlier. And again here, further extension going further around um, with some first floor balconies there as well. The ground floor accommodation proposed um, will be two biology laboratories here and four chemistry labs here, here and here. The first floor level, um, again two biology labs and a further three chemistry labs here. There will also be some further space provided for staff accommodation, uh, sort of administrative accommodation. This is the proposed roof plan. You'll note here, this is the existing building at the moment in the darker grey. The proposed is here and here. You'll note that the extension has been purposefully separated from this side of this building and not extending off it. Other elements within the scheme also include some smaller extension work to the existing building. Um, a second floor roof extension is proposed um, to the existing museum building, um, not off the an original part of the building, but of a, a, of a later addition. Um, this will provide two additional maths classrooms to the school. These are two small link extensions 
um, which I'll be able to point out to you later in the slides as to where they're, they're proposed. Um, but again, they are to um, be of a contemporary design reflecting the form of the extension. The toilet building proposed is to be of a, a simple single story uh, brick building. Um, so you can outline here the elevations here and the floor plan here. And the temporary um, cabins proposed um, would be your, your simple modular type temporary structures, um, really just going through each of them. So this is the temporary sports cabin. Uh, the IT would require uh, two floors. And here we are on to some site photographs. Um, the proposal includes demolition of some existing buildings. Uh, this small building here is proposed to be removed. Um, really, members, just to give you an idea of some of the existing buildings uh, on the site. That is part of the museum building. <coughs> this other flat roof building here is proposed to be removed. This is the view across um, from the playing field looking east. Um, the reason I put this side in is to really show that the, the building line um, for the proposed extension would be of the same front building line as this building here. Um, to the left is Hurtmore Road, um, and it's just to help put it into a bit of context, showing some of the existing built form that's forward of this building line. Um, and a wider view here from the existing entrance to the school. Um, that's the existing building there, known as New Block. And the proposed extension would go here. And again, a uh, further closer up view showing the area where the extension would go. These buildings here would be removed. The remainder would, would be retained. This is the, you could say, the principal elevation of the museum building. Um, other smaller aspects of the scheme include some very small new roof pitch additions here and on the other side. The second floor um, roof extension to provide two maths classrooms would go here. Um, this wing uh, is just called the southern wing and that is a later addition to this building. Uh, this building is grade two listed. The extension itself would come off here and they're behind here, sorry, and thereby the majority of this area would be remain, remain as is. And this is again uh, a view from the western, showing the western elevation of the museum building, um, where the extension would go down the side there, back and up here. This is called a useful 3D aerial photograph showing um, in pink the existing building uh, and in yellow where the proposed would go. Um, you'll note some of the existing, give an idea of some of the existing architecture in the surrounding area, um, some flat roof buildings here and traditional buildings here. And again members just to help um, give an idea of the existing architecture on the site, um, the site does contain a list of buildings, uh, the grade two star chapel building here, the remaining buildings are grade two, including the museum building here, and the extension is proposed to go here, alongside this building, new block. Um, and here's a, a 3D visual aid to show where the extensions are proposed. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, some infill link extensions um, is here, the second floor roof extension here, and the main extension here. Again, some further visual aids to show really how the extension would join a listed building. Um, as I noted earlier, a lot of the wing, the north wing would remain unaltered. Um, and this is a, a 3D visual showing the link extension, how that would sit with the, with the building. So members, here's a, a, a 3D visual aid of the um, north elevation of the proposed extension. Um, it is obviously the, the most prominent elevation to public eye. Um, 
and the proposal also includes these three chimney features. Um, in terms of design, um, officers have worked closely with, with the applicants um, in terms of getting a, a good design for the scheme. Um, I think a key thing to note is, is building heights. Um, you'll see here just on the right that the actual eaves height of the adjacent building is, is higher than, than that of the proposed. Um, and the roof line would further be lower. However, the chimney features obviously would be higher. Um, but these are just to help you um, get an understanding of the type of pattern of materials and colours that, that the building would have. Um, this is view from inside the site showing the uh, south elevation. You'll note here the, this is the timber loose where the, the walkway would be proposed where um, pupils can enter the classrooms at first floor from ground floor from the outside. And again, um, view from internal showing the likely landscape area that they would, they would seek. Um, there's the North Elevation Museum building that wouldn't be um, affected. Members, in terms of determining issues with this application, um, the site is within the, within the green belt. Um, you'll note in the officer's report that we consider the extension to be disproportionate to the host built original building. Um, also, the erection of the toilet building and the porter cabin buildings are technically also inappropriate development. Um, however, we consider that there are very special circumstances in this case um, to allow the proposal. Um, those are set out in the report. However, obviously, there are members' judgment. Um, educational establishments and needs the MPPF requires us to give um, weight to educational needs. Um, the visual amenity and landscape, uh, the proposal we consider to be of a, a good design um, that would provide a good facility for the school. It would stay within the front building line of an existing building. Um, residential amenity, um, the siting of the buildings themselves are um, far away from residents. Um, and heritage assets, uh, further, this um, is a key consideration. Uh, we've had a very detailed response from English Heritage, which is there for you in, in the report. Um, we have identified um, that there would be some less su substantial harm with the removal of some um, original features within the existing listed building. Um, however, the benefits of the scheme are considered to outweigh this. Um, there is a pending list of building consent application, which, um, which is still currently under consideration, um, which would capture um, a number of details regarding the actual internal works and, and build quality. Um, that would in, in, ensure a good, good design um, is achieved. Members, if I can turn your attention now to the update sheet, um, you'll note that we've had uh, additional comments from the Surrey Wildlife Trust, um, and you can see officer response to those there. Uh, we have further had additional comments from the agent for the application, um, outlining their, their um, comments on uh, a condition that officers have recommended in the update sheet. Um, further to the officer response in the update sheet to, to this issue, um, again, the, the agent has, has submitted some further comments uh, since the production of that sheet. Um, I'm going to summarise them for you now. Um, they outline that the proposal is proposed in order to meet current demand for science and maths subjects and further that the proposed number of rooms directly correlates to the number of existing teachers for each subject. At present the school has no such condition limiting numbers, number of pupils and has grown organically with no impact on the wider area. The condition proposed is considered to be a significant constraint to the school and the condition is therefore considered to be unreasonable. 
and, are cons and is considered to conflict with the MPPF and MPPG. Um, in officer's response to that, um, we've carefully considered this additional statement. Um, however, the site, it is within the green belt, and having regard to the scale of additional accommodation sought, officers consider that the suggested condition is reasonable to ensure that the future impact on surrounding area is safeguarded. So members, having regard, regard to that, um, officer's recommendation remains as set out for you on the update sheet. Uh, that permission be granted. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Tim. And um, before we go to um, EU members, I'd just like to say that uh, we're, we're the benefit this evening of, of having been joined by Russell Morris, our historic buildings officer. Um, and so um, if you do have any questions that uh, um, officers feel uh, can be um, um, assisted or answered by you, Russell, um, if you indicate that would be really useful. Thank you very much. So, um, Councillor Reynolds, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. This, this is in my ward, and um, I have to say, um, looking at the application, I, th I think they're doing quite a good job, actually. I like to see something which isn't a sort of pastiche of what's already there, and Charter House, I think, has previously demonstrated in almost all circumstances, not entirely all of them, um, that uh, they can do quite nicely designed modern buildings which fit alongside the, uh, the listed old buildings that are there at the moment. So um, in terms of um, this uh, application and of the, the buildings proposed, I think it's fine. Historic England are raising very few objections, and I think there's probably just a few informatives. And from what I know of Child House School, they do tend to do things fairly well. So they're very conscious of their historic surroundings, the building that they occupy, its importance um, you know, historically and also visually. So I think they would do a good job of any extension and you know, big development like this. Um, what I am very concerned about, however, is the, the new um, um, condition that uh, officers have decided to impose on the school, which is to, to limit school numbers to what exists at the moment. And I personally, I agree with the school that I think this is sort of unfounded and unnecessary, equally slightly unrealistic. We should be we should be supporting this school. This school is a big employer in Godalming. It's probably possibly the second or third largest employer in the town. Um, the students come here. It's got a good re reputation. Um, the students come. They spend money in our town. Their parents come and visit. And, you know, the, the site will still be constrained as to student numbers as to how many they can accommodate on the site. Now, if they wish to increase student numbers by 200, then I suspect they will have to come to us with an application to build a new dormitory, which will have 200 bedrooms. And at that point, we might say, no, sorry, we don't want to do that. But I think to, to put a constraint on student numbers purely because they want to put to new and better classrooms to aid the teaching of two very important subjects is, is, in my view, absolutely wrong. And while I will support this application, uh, for the um, building they wish to build, I would refuse to support the condition that you wish to impose because I just don't think it is realistic, necessary, and uh, and something we should be doing. We shouldn't be constraining a school of this importance in Godalming. It will be constrained by its site. And I think the green belt came along long after the school was built. So um, you know, I think I think they've demonstrated that they protect their green belt very well. So uh, they are an asset to this town, and um, I would not support that condition, but I will support the application. Elizabeth, you wish to come back on that? Thank you, Chairman. I, I, I hope it, it's, it's all right to come back at this stage. I know other members may want to talk on this condition, but I, I just wanted to make absolutely clear to the committee that we're not um, recommending this condition because we feel that Charterhouse should never be able to expand in the future. Um, it wouldn't be reasonable for us to actually impose that on them. But what we are recommending is because the school is saying at the current time that this accommodation is required to meet the current needs of, of um, the school and it's not intended to increase the school role, on the face of it, that doesn't present us with a problem in terms of any uh, likely increased activity from the site going forward or indeed um, within the site because arguably it's about mopping up existing demand with better buildings. However, if there were to be an increase in school role as a, as a consequence of this accommodation and there were unexpected parking demand, additional parking demands, um, traffic demands, um, or need for additional buildings, um, it, it does raise the question as to whether or not at the time of granting this, 
um, we properly considered the position about whether or not we're restricting or en enabling the council to have further control over increases in the school role in the future. So it is very much your judgment. If you feel you want to trust the school to go by its word and it is just accommodation for its current needs, so be it. But we we're thinking um, more broadly in the way that the council's approached uh, similar applications for schools in the borough, whereby they said there's no increase in the school role required. And um, the council has imposed such a condition to say, well, for the purposes of this application, we are requiring the school role to, to, to do as you're saying, to be maintained at the same level. But if in the future you do wish to increase it, then you would come forward with an application to vary the condition and explain the basis of the increase. And I suspect the council would be minded to approve the principle, but it just gives you that, that leverage, that degree of control. But it is a judgment. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. I'm going to let Councillor Reynolds come back on that. Just, just, just briefly, I mean, the, the site is enormous. I mean, I've, I've, I've lived uh, very close to that site to, for 20 odd years. I don't currently at the moment, but I, I did. And you know, I, I know the site. I walk my dog there. I, I, they used to permit access because we used to live at the bottom of the hill. So you used to be able to drive through the site in the old days. There's plenty of parking on site and there's plenty of available parking. And I have to say, in all the 25, 30 years I've driven past the school, I do so every morning, I've never once been involved in a, uh, a traffic jam that has been the, the fault of the school or traffic going in and out of the school. So, I, I, personally, I don't see a problem. I just don't think we need to put an unnecessary extra burden onto the school. I just don't think it's the right thing, personally. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I think it was uh, Councillor Tom Martin. Um, thank you. I, I have to say, I, I share Councillor Reynolds' concerns about Condition 10. Um, I, I also don't think it's, it's right that we should limit it. If that said, um, given um, what Mr Sims has said um, about the school saying that, that this won't have any bearing on the school numbers, and incorporating what the school itself has said, that essentially what this condition does is mean that they can't even fluctuate by one without essentially um, coming a cropper against this permission. And, and we don't know whether this, if you take the numbers based on the academic period 2015 to 16, um, it could be a low year. Um, I, I'm a governor at, at, a, at, a, at another school. Numbers do sometimes go up and down a, a little bit. I wonder if at the very least we could put a sort of percentage um, variance, 10% um, or so, that, that gives the school some wriggle room um, that said, I'd be entirely happy to see Condition 10 removed entirely. Councillor Thornton. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I same, share the same views as uh, Councillor Martin and Councillor Reynolds. And uh, it is a boarding school, and 95% of the children there do board. And I drive past there every morning to take my daughter to school, and I n have never seen a traffic jam. And for, to impose um, the, this condition 10, I think, is quite unreasonable, to be honest. Thank you. Councillor Martin. Thank you. Um, I'm going to declare an interest that I'm chairman of governors of another independent school, um, but it's an, an all-girls independent school, and this is primarily a boys' school. It's not really competitive, but I just feel a need to declare that as an interest. Um, I, I, uh, it's amazing uh, what you can get away with if you're an educational establishment, if you're in the green belt, isn't it? You know, when I think of the green belt and with, with this that we're looking at compared with the application that we saw for a house earlier on. Uh, just a small aside. <laughs> um, uh, and I do have a slight problem uh, because if we look at page 105 um, on the, uh, with the uh, educational establishments uh, discussion by... Uh, by the officers, we, we, we talk about the MPPF attaching great importance to ensuring that a sufficient choice of school places is available to meet the needs of existing and new communities. Great weight should be given to the need to create, expand or alter schools to meet the requirements of communities and to widen the choices available in education. But I have to say, I think, you know, with a, with a boarding school, a school which is primarily a boarding school, which brings in its pupils primarily from abroad and from distant places, I'm not quite sure that this is really relevant in terms of meeting the requirements of the uh, local community. However, having said all that, um, I, you know, and then to, do a, to a degree that then, that then conflicts a bit with condition 10. 
Um, so, you know, we're sort of arguing it both ways, you know, that oh, we, we, we want to change it using MPPF, but then over on the condition tab, we're, going, we're not going to allow them to expand. Or, uh, I, I have to say, on balance, I would not have um, a condition 10. I would support removing uh, that. Uh, on the general uh, business of these extraordinary um, chimneys, uh, I hope they're not going to be belching smoke. I get the idea it's for, it's for fumes and things of that sort from the chemistry labs rather than uh, lighting um, uh, fires and having uh, smoke and goodness knows what coming out of them. I, I actually find it very attractive. And there's a discussion of this uh, on page um, 99, uh, drawing the comparison with, um, uh, with another development in Cambridge, uh, which won um, an award. Um, so I, I agree with Councillor Reynolds. I think we should have things which are different and, and, and extraordinary and eye-catching. Uh, uh, and I think that this is, this is great. Um, so on balance, overall, um, I, I will support the officers, but I would prefer to remove the condition 10. Thank you. Councillor Wheatley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of points of clarification, if you don't mind. Um, on page 83, the third paragraph up, it says the single-storey link extension would be two-storey. <laughs> and um, in the illustrations we have, they're funny sort of flag-like things flying around. Do we know what they are, please? <laughs> flag-like things. Yes, I, I think the flag things were markings on the drawings showing where other drawings were producing cross sections so that's so I think there were a drawing convention not something that was going to be built so the, the, the little flags meant at that point a cross section can be found in another drawing so could we have some confirmation on this one a single story being two stories please officers So, I should remember just to clarify the extension. Um, I slightly miscued the word there, but it's part single story down here to part two story here. So, the single story link below here to two story here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Are we happy with that? Are there any more? Now we need to know whether there's a proposal. A proposal. Well, could I propose the acceptance of this, but without condition 10, please? I'm happy to second. We have a seconder. We have a thirder. <laughs> okay, and now we vote on that. Can I have a show of hands, please, on who supports that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, unanimous. Thank you. So, um, the recommendation, oh, any last questions? No, we're finished now, aren't we? The recommendation is that subject to referral to the Secretary of State and subject to conditions one to nine and informatives one to eight as set out in the report, uh, permission be granted. Unanimous. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, unanimous. The recommendation to grant is agreed. Thank you very much. Now, uh, item B3, WA 2015-1659-98-99 Great George Street, Godalming, GU7-1EE. Oh, thank you very much, um, Russell, and good night. Um, Gemma, would you like to introduce the application, please? Okay, thank you very much, Chairman. The site lies to the west of Great George Street and is occupied by a three-storey, Grade Two listed building, currently in a lawful D1 non-residential institution use at ground and first floor, and in a Class D2 assembly and leisure use at second floor. The ground and first floors were previously accommodated by Waverley Training Services until it was vacated in January 2015. The second floor previously accommodated a ladies-only gym and has been vacant for some time. 
The application seeks to change part of the ground floor, the first floor and the second floor, to residential in order to provide four one-bedroom units. A change of use of part of the ground floor is sought in order to provide an independent access to the residential units from the existing ground floor commercial use. The proposal would also involve the erection of a barn-hipped roof over the existing flat roof element to accommodate one of the proposed residential units. The proposed barn-hipped roof would increase the height of the building from 6.5 metres to 10 metres and would involve the installation of five dormer windows. The floor areas of the proposed residential units would vary between 37 metres squared and 60 metres squared and would comprise open plan living room, kitchen with a bedroom and bathroom. I'm just going to show you through some of the slides. This is the existing north elevation <coughs> and this would be the proposed north elevation with the hipped roof. And this is facing uh, the rear courtyard. This is the existing west elevation and the proposed west elevation. There's some site pictures for you. Uh, this is looking from Great George Street. And this will be the flat roof where the hips roof element would go over. And this is the rear courtyard, just to get an idea of the buildings in the courtyard. Moving to the left of the slide, the matters of principle and technical opinion are the principal development, having regard to the locations of the site within the developed area, the loss of the commercial use, noting that officers are satisfied that the level of marketing taken place demonstrates that the first and second floors are unlikely to appeal to prospective commercial users and that the proposed residential use would contribute to the vi viability and vitality of the town centre. Housing land supply, noting that the proposal would make a small contribution to the borough's housing stock. Impact on highways and parking. In considering that Surrey County Council have raised no objection to the pro scheme in terms of highway safety and parking provision. Although the proposed residential units would not comply with the council's parking guidelines, consideration has to be given to the fact that the lawful extant uses also do not comply with the council's parking guidelines. Furthermore, officers consider that the sustainable location of the site and the availability of, sorry, availability of alternative means of public transport, together with availability of nearby car parking in Crown Court could be seen to outweigh the parking deficiency. Finally, archaeology, having regard to the expert's advice of the county archaeologist. Moving to the right of the slide, members are being asked to exercise their judgment on the matters of visual impact on visual amenity, noting the impact of the prose conversion and new roof on the character and appearance of the area, the impact on heritage assets, considering that the expert opinion of the Council's Historic Building Officer is that the proposal would not cause harm to the fabric of the listed building and would improve the vistas of Great George Street and would enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area. Um, impact on residential amenity, standard of accommodation, and noting that the proposal would meet the minimum gross internal floor areas. As an oral update to this application, the County's Air Quality Officer has raised no objection to the proposed scheme subject to conditions to secure a site management plan for the suppression of dust and emissions and to restrict construction hours. A further oral update to this application is that the county archaeologist has raised no objection to the proposed scheme and has recommended no conditions. Therefore, the revised recommendation is that subject to the additional site management condition and construction hours condition as recommended by the council's air quality officer, as well as conditions one to four set out on pages 151 to 153 of the agenda and informatives one to four on page 153 of the agenda that permission be granted thank you very much chairman thank you Gemma and um, councillor Thornton thank you thank you chairman <clears throat> well as wall councillor uh, for this property there's a few there's a few things that have, have, have come to light I mean the refuse using ref just let's start off actually with the backyard it's not actually the building's backyard that belongs to um, the dog trust and um, a the next the next shop the shoe shop next door, so they both park their cars in there, and there's no rear access to that from those buildings. So it says here, using calculation under paragraph 5.5, the council's requirements for refuse and recycling on new development gardens number four. 
The four number one bedroom residential units would expect to generate 400 litres of refuse per fortnight, which is a 400 litre ref recycling per fortnight. So they're, they're proposing to put a 660 litre wheelie, wheelie container for refuse for all flats, which they've got to walk out the front of the, if we can go back to the, the um, So they've got to walk, walk out the front there, go all the way around the back to put their refuse in. And if you notice, all the refuse bins on the, on the uh, high street there. So the, all these, all these... George Street. Yeah, George Street. All these um, that were business premises have now all got wheelie bins. And there's 14 wheelie bins so far along that high bit of road. And this is just going to add to that. Also, there's a, there's, a, there's a statement that officers have made, officers further consideration that as a result of offering no dedicated vehicle parking and limited advertisement opportunities to attract passing trade as the result of, sit, of, of its citing, the prospects of fulfilling the first floor and second floor of the premises with other form of commercial facility would be limited. And then it goes on to say, the ground floor is currently vacant, so bringing back into use would not only provide clear economic benefits, it would also in introduce frontage activities that would, would add vi visual interest at street level, encouraging visitors and those spending money in the commercial town. So in one side, officers have said that there's no limited advertisement, and the other side, it's going to... Um, provide economic benefits. I, don't, I can't see why. I don't want to lose um, office space, and it was, it was B1 before it went to D1. Why, why can't we go back? Why can't the applicant go back to B1 and offices? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thornton. I must admit, I agree with you about the wheelie bins. I really don't want to see us creating a street full of wheelie bins. It's already halfway there now, so I think it's a good point. Councillor Reynolds. Well, subject to that point, what has, do we know for certain that they can put all these wheelie bins and four bicycles stored in a courtyard that appears, appears to belong to a different, a different building, a different premises, a different owner? Um, I think we need to know this before we can make a proper decision on, on this application, because as you say, the, 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 the whole of that frontage is surrounded by these dreadful wheelie bins, and if we're going to have another four bicycle racks somewhere or other along that Great George Street, it's, it's going to be greatly visual intrusive, and I would reject this application on the grounds of visual amenity. Are there any, any more comments? Because if not, we need to move on to the... Uh, all officers, do you want to come back and answer Councillor Reynolds' question? Sorry, uh, Chairman, if I could just come back on, on the point about the refuse. Um, it is our understanding that the rear courtyard could offer a facility to be able to provide the parking bin, and therefore that's why the condition is on there, to demonstrate that the applicant can provide it in accordance with the council standard. Um, that was the expectation given to us from the applicant. Thank you. So we think we know otherwise. Um, however, Councillor Martin... Well, is it therefore possible to create a requirement that they use that as a condition of the um, of, of this? I mean, or is it, uh, the, or uh, how do we stop them um, permanently? And, uh, are those bins there permanently, or are they just they're, they're there all the time? So our objective is to prevent people from being able to join that brigade and then permanently to put their bins outside. So, other than on collection day, could we require that they are uh, they are where they should be as a condition? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think in terms of the control that you would have in planning terms, you'd have to be certain that the condition uh, can require reasonably details of a space to store the bins. What you can't do is say your bins will always be stored in this space. It's a bit like parking. You can require parking spaces provided, but if someone decides to park on the road, 
you can't take enforcement action because they've decided to park somewhere else. All you can do is require them to provide details that satisfy you that it will be accessible, large enough, on land within their control to the point at which there's a, there's a reasonable possibility they will want to store it there and they will use it. Um, in this instance, we have obviously had the dialogue with the applicants and they've indicated they will be able to provide this sufficient information. That's what the condition is there for. Obviously, as planning authority, you have absolute control over the details. If the details are submitted and they don't satisfy the council that uh, sufficient space can be provided within their control, then the condition discharge could be refused. Um, that is not unusual to control it in that way. Um, what I would say, if, if members are sufficiently concerned about this, that you would like the information up front, then rather than refuse it on that basis, it would be better to defer the application, to require the apl applicant to submit that information up front to satisfy you that they, ha they are able to provide adequate bin storage. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Thornton. Can I propose to defer the application until we actually have, have a report back from um, Environmental Health and also find out who the land, I know who the land belongs to and, uh, and just to make sure that the bins are and, and, and bicycles because I know for a fact the land isn't, doesn't belong and there's no rear access from these properties also to that, to that rear courtyard. Thank you, Councillor Martin. I think. Well, yes, I, I, I agree with that um, proposal. Um, and just to add, do I understand that from what Thorn Councillor Thornton said earlier, the occupants would have to go out of, the, out of there and around the corner to get to the, to the bin? That's the point. They, they'd have to go a long distance, and therefore the temptation to stick the bin outside the front door is going to be very great, rather than having to trot round uh, three sides of a square and around the other side of the building to get to where the bins are stored. Councillor Ells. Uh, thank you. Yes, if, uh, if they're citing bins on land which isn't part of the, in their ownership, then surely they have to serve a notice number one, and that should be included in the, on, in, in the red line showing the site boundary. I mean, they can't just willy-nilly say we're going to stick bins somewhere outside of their site, can they? Well, no, the, the, the planners can see from where the red line is whether, whether they're putting the bins and the bikes within their land or not. And if they're not within their land, then they have to issue a notice, number one, on the, the property owner, who then has the opportunity to come back and say they're not sticking their bins and their bikes on my land. Can we have an answer then, officers? Chairman, I think we agree that probably, given members' questions, it would be better to defer this for us to come back with the information that you're asking to satisfy you on this. Okay, so... Um, I'm happy to propose that we defer this one. Okay, the Chairman's happy to propose that we defer, and we need a seconder. Uh, whoa, you've got a good choice there. And uh, now we need to vote on, on that, so we want to defer. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 11, 12, 13, unanimous. So, uh, the recommend... Uh, I think we now need to. Hmm. We have to get rid of that. So, do I read that? No. Okay, so uh, the final decision is that we have deferred this application. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.